Chapter One of the Life and Death of Harriet Freen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. Chapter One. Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? i've been to london to see the queen pussycat pussycat what did you there i caught a little mouse under the chair her mother said it three times and each time the baby harriet laughed the sound of her laugh was so funny that she laughed again at that she kept on laughing with shriller and shriller squeals i wonder why she thinks it's funny her mother said her father considered it i don't know the cat perhaps the cat and the queen but no that isn't funny she sees something in it we don't see bless her said her mother each kissed her in turn and the baby harriet stopped laughing suddenly mamma did pussycat see the queen no said mamma just when the queen was passing the little mouse came out of its hole and ran under the chair that's what pussycat saw every evening before bedtime she said the same rhyme and harriet asked the same question when nurse had gone she would lie still in her cot waiting the door would open the big pointed shadow would move over the ceiling the lattice shadow of the fire guard would fade and go away and mamma would come in carrying the lighted candle her face shone white between her long hanging curls she would stoop over the cot and lift harriet up and her face would be hidden in curls that was the kiss me to sleep kiss and when she had gone harriet lay still again waiting presently papa would come in large and dark in the firelight he stooped and she leapt up into his arms that was the kiss me awake kiss it was their secret then they played papa was the pussy-cat and she was the little mouse in her hole under the bedclothes they played till papa said no more and tucked the blankets tight in now you're kissing like mamma hours afterwards they would come again together and stoop over the cot and she wouldn't see them they would kiss her with soft light kisses and she wouldn't know she thought tonight i'll stay awake and see them but she never did only once she dreamed that she heard footsteps and saw the lighted candle going out of the room going going away the blue egg stood on the marble top of the cabinet where you could see it from everywhere it was supported by a gold waistband by gold hoops and gold legs and it wore a gold ball with a frill round it like a crown you would never have guessed what was inside it you touched a spring in its waistband and it flew open and then it was a work-box gold scissors and thimble and stiletto sitting up in holes cut in white velvet the blue egg was the first thing she thought of when she came into the room there was nothing like that in connie hancock's papa's house it belonged to mamma harriet thought if only she could have a birthday and wake up and find that the blue egg belonged to her ida the wax doll sat on the drawing-room sofa dressed ready for the birthday the darling had real person's eyes made of glass and real eyelashes and hair little finger and toenails were marked in the wax and she smelt of the lavender her clothes were laid in but emily the new birthday doll smelt of composition and of gum and hay she had flat painted hair and eyes and a foolish look on her face like nurse's aunt mrs spinker when she said lock a daisy although papa had given her emily she could never feel for her the real loving love she felt for ida and her mother had told her that she must lend ida to connie hancock if connie wanted her mamma couldn't see that such a thing was not possible my darling you mustn't be selfish you must do what your little guest wants i can't but she had to and she was sent out of the room because she cried it was much nicer upstairs in the nursery with mimi the angora cat mimi knew that something sorrowful had happened he sat still just lifting the root of his tail as you stroked him if only she could have stayed there with mimi but in the end she had to go back to the drawing-room if only she could have told mamma what it felt like to see connie with ida in her arms squeezing her tight to her chest and patting her as if ida had been her child she kept on saying to herself that mamma didn't know 
she didn't know what she had done and when it was all over she took the wax doll and put her in the long narrow box she had come in and buried her in the bottom drawer in the spare-room wardrobe she thought if i can't have her to myself i won't have her at all i've got emily i shall just have to pretend she's not an idiot she pretended ida was dead lying in her pasteboard coffin and buried in the wardrobe cemetery it was hard work pretending that emily didn't look like mrs spinker End of chapter 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 2 of The Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 2. She had a belief that her father's house was nicer than other people's houses it stood off from the high road in black's lane at the head of the town you came to it by a row of tall elms standing up along mr hancock's wall behind the last tree its slender white end went straight up from the pavement hanging out a green balcony like a bird-cage above the green door the lane turned sharp there and went on and the long brown garden wall went with it behind the wall the lawn flowed down from the white house and the green veranda to the cedar tree at the bottom beyond the lawn was the kitchen garden and beyond the kitchen garden the orchard little crippled apple trees bending down in the long grass she was glad to come back to the house after the walk with eliza the nurse or annie the housemaid to go through all the rooms looking for mimi looking for mamma telling her what had happened mamma the red-haired woman in the sweetie shop has got a little baby and its hair is red too some day i shall have a little baby i shall dress him in a long gown robe robe with bands of lace all down it as long as that and a white christening cloak sewn with white roses won't he look sweet very sweet he shall have lots of hair i shan't love him if he hasn't oh yes you will no he must have thick flossy hair like mimi so that i can stroke him which would you rather have a little girl or a little boy well what do you think i think perhaps i'd rather have a little girl she would be like mamma and her little girl would be like herself she couldn't think of it any other way the school treat was held in mr hancock's field all afternoon she had been with the children playing oranges and lemons a ring a ring of roses and here we come gathering nuts in may nuts in may nuts in may over and over again and she had helped her mother to hand cake and buns at the infant's table the guest children's tea was served last of all up on the lawn under the immense brown brick many-windowed house there wasn't room for everybody at the table so the girls sat down first and the boys waited for their turn some of them were pushing and snatching she knew what she would have she would begin with a bun and go on through two sorts of jam to madeira cake and end with raspberries and cream or perhaps it would be safer to begin with raspberries and cream she kept her face very still so as not to look greedy and tried not to stare at the madeira cake lest people should see what she was thinking of it mrs hancock had given her somebody else's crummy plate she thought i'm not greedy i'm really and truly hungry she could draw herself in at the waist with a flat exhausted feeling like the two ends of a concertina coming together she was doing this when she saw her mother standing on the other side of the table looking at her and making signs if you're finished hattie you'd better get up and let that little boy have something they were all turning round and looking at her and there was the crummy plate before her they were thinking that greedy little girl has gone on and on eating she got up suddenly not speaking and left the table the madeira cake and the raspberries and cream she could feel her skin all hot and wet with shame and now she was sitting up in the drawing-room at home her mother had brought her a piece of seed cake and a cup of milk with the cream on it mamma's soft eyes kissed her as they watched her eating her cake with short crumbly bites like a little cat mamma's eyes made her feel so good so good why didn't you tell me you hadn't finished finished i hadn't even begun oh darling why didn't you tell me because i, I don't know well i'm glad my little girl didn't snatch and push it's better to go without than to take from other people that's ugly ugly 
being naughty was just that doing ugly things being good was being beautiful like mamma she wanted to be like her mother sitting up there and being good felt delicious and the smooth cream with the milk running under it thin and cold was delicious too suddenly a thought came rushing at her there was god and there was jesus but even god and jesus were not more beautiful than mamma they couldn't be you mustn't say things like that hattie you mustn't really it might make something happen oh no it won't you don't suppose they're listening all the time saying things like that made you feel good and at the same time naughty which was more exciting than only being one or the other but mamma's frightened face spoiled it what did she think what did she think god would do red campion at the bottom of the orchard a door in the wall opened into black's lane below the three tall elms she couldn't believe she was really walking there by herself it had come all of a sudden the thought that she must do it that she must go out into the lane and when she found the door unlatched something seemed to take hold of her and push her out she was forbidden to go into black's lane she was not even allowed to walk there with annie she kept on saying to herself i'm in the lane i'm in the lane i'm disobeying mamma nothing could undo that she had disobeyed by just standing outside the orchard door disobedience was such a big and awful thing that it was waste not to do something big and awful with it so she went on up and up past the three tall elms she was a big girl wearing black silk aprons and learning french walking by herself when she arched her back and stuck her stomach out she felt like a tall lady in a crinoline and shawl she swung her hips and made her skirts fly out that was her grown-up crinoline swing swinging as she went at the turn the cow's parsley and rose campion began on each side a long trail of white froth with the red tops of the campion pricking through she made herself a nosegay past the second turn you came to the waste ground covered with old boots and rusted crumpled tins the little dirty brown house stood there behind the rickety blue palings narrow like the piece of a house that has been cut in two it hid stooping under the ivy bush on its roof it was not like the houses people live in there was something queer some secret frightening thing about it the man came out and went to the gate and stood there he was the frightening thing when he saw her he stepped back and crouched behind the palings ready to jump out she turned slowly as if she had thought of something she mustn't run she must not run if she ran he would come after her her mother was coming down the garden walk tall and beautiful in her silver-gray gown with the bands of black velvet on the flounces and the sleeves her wide hooped skirt swung brushing the flower borders she ran up to her crying mamma i went up the lane where you told me not to no hattie no you didn't you could see she wasn't angry she was frightened i did i did her mother took the bunch of flowers out of her hand and looked at it yes she said that's where the dark red campion grows she was holding the flowers up to her face it was awful for you could see her mouth thicken and redden over its edges and shake she hid it behind the flowers and somehow you knew it wasn't your naughtiness that made her cry there was something more she was saying in a thick soft voice it was wrong of you my darling suddenly she bent her tall straightness rose campion she said parting the stems with her long thin fingers look hattie how beautiful they are run away and put the poor things in water she was so quiet so quiet and her quietness hurt far more than if she had been angry she must have gone straight back into the house to papa harriet knew because he sent for her he was quiet too that was the little hiding voice he told you secrets in she stood close up to him between his knees and his arm went loosely round her to keep her there while he looked into her eyes you could smell tobacco and the queer clean man's smell that came up out of him from his collar he wasn't smiling but somehow his eyes looked kinder than if they had smiled why did you do it hattie because i wanted to see what it would feel like you mustn't do it again do you hear you mustn't do it why why because it makes your mother unhappy that's enough why but there was something more mamma had been frightened something to do with the frightening man in the lane why does it make her she knew she knew but she wanted to see what he would say i said that was enough 
do you know what you've been guilty of disobedience more than that breaking trust meanness it was mean and dishonourable of you when you knew you wouldn't be punished isn't there to be a punishment no people are punished to make them remember we want you to forget his arm tightened drawing her closer and the kind secret voice went on forget ugly things understand hattie nothing is forbidden we don't forbid because we trust you to do what we wish to behave beautifully there there she hid her face on his breast against his tickly coat and cried she would always have to do what they wanted the unhappiness of not doing it was more than she could bear all very well to say there would be no punishment their unhappiness was the punishment it hurt more than anything it kept on hurting when she thought about it the first minute of to-morrow she would begin behaving beautifully as beautifully as she could they wanted you to they wanted it more than anything because they were so beautiful so good so wise but three years went before harriet understood how wise they had been and why her mother took her again and again into black's lane to pick red campion so that it was always the red campion she remembered they must have known all the time about black's lane annie the housemaid used to say it was a bad place something had happened to a little girl there annie hushed and reddened and wouldn't tell you what it was then one day when she was thirteen standing by the apple tree connie hancock told her a secret behind the dirty blue palings she shut her eyes squeezing the lids down frightened but when she thought of the lane she could see nothing but the green banks the three tall elms and the red campion pricking through the white froth of the cow's parsley her mother stood on the garden walk in her wide swinging gown she was holding the red and white flowers up to her face and saying look how beautiful they are she saw her all the time while connie was telling her the secret she wanted to get up and go to her connie knew what it meant when you stiffened suddenly and made yourself tall and cold and silent the cold silence would frighten her and she would go away then harriet thought she could get back to her mother and longfellow every afternoon through the hours before her father came home she sat in the cool green lighted drawing-room reading evangeline aloud to her mother when they came to the beautiful places they looked at each other and smiled she passed through her fourteenth year sedately to the sound of evangeline her upright body her lifted delicately obstinate rather wistful face expressed her small conscious determination to be good she was silent with emotion when mrs hancock told her she was growing like her mother End of chapter 2. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 3 of Life and Death of Harriet Freen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair chapter three connie hancock was her friend she had once been a slender wide-mouthed child top-heavy with her damp clumps of hair now she was squaring and thickening and looking horrid like mr hancock beside her harriet felt tall and elegant and slender mamma didn't know what connie was really like it was one of those things you couldn't tell her she said connie would grow out of it meanwhile you could see he wouldn't mr hancock had red whiskers and his face squatted down in his collar instead of rising nobly up out of it like papa's it looked as if it was thinking things that made its eyes bulge and its mouth curl over and slide like a drawn loop when you talked about mr hancock papa gave a funny laugh as if he was something improper he said connie ought to have red whiskers mrs hancock connie's mother was mamma's dearest friend that was why there had always been connie she could remember her squirming and spluttering in her high nursery chair and there had always been mrs hancock refined and mournful looking at you with gentle disappointed eyes she was glad that connie hadn't been sent to her boarding school so that nothing could come between her and priscilla heaven priscilla was her real friend it had begun in her third term when priscilla first came to the school unhappy and shy afraid of the new faces 
harriet took her to her room she was thin thin in her shabby black velvet jacket she stood looking at herself in the greenish glass over the yellow painted chest of drawers her heavy black hair had dragged the net and broken it she put up her thin arms helpless they'll never keep me she said i'm so untidy it wants more pins said harriet ever so many more pins if you put them in head downwards they'll fall out i'll show you priscilla trembled with joy when harriet asked to walk with her she had been afraid of her at first because she behaved so beautifully soon they were always together they sat side by side at the dinner-table and in school black head and golden brown leaning to each other over the same book they walked side by side in the packed procession going two by two they slept in the same room the two white beds drawn close together a white dimity curtain hung between they drew it back so that they could see each other lying there in the summer dusk and in the clear mornings when they waked harriet loved priscilla's odd dusk-white face her long hound's nose seeking her wide mouth restless between her shallow fragile jaws her eyes black cleared with spots of jade grey prominent showing white rims when she was startled she started at sudden noises she quivered and stared when you caught her dreaming she cried when the organ burst out triumphantly in church you had to take care every minute that you didn't hurt her she cried when term ended and she had to go home priscilla's home was horrible her father drank her mother fretted they were poor a rich aunt paid for her schooling when the last midsummer holidays came she spent them with harriet oh prissy drew in her breath when she heard they were to sleep together in the big bed in the spare room she went about looking at things curious touching them softly as if they were sacred she loved the two rough-coated china lambs on the chimney-piece and oh the dear little china boxes with the flowers sitting up on them but when the bell rang she stood quivering in the doorway i'm afraid of your father and mother hattie they won't like me i know they won't like me they will they'll love you hattie said and they did they were sorry for the little white-faced palpitating thing it was their last night priscilla wasn't going back to school again her aunt she said was only paying for a year they lay together in the big bed dim face to face talking hattie if you wanted to do something most awfully more than anything else in the world and it was wrong would you be able not to do it i hope so i think i would because i'd know if i did it it would make papa and mamma unhappy yes but suppose it was giving up something you wanted something you loved more than them could you yes if it was wrong for me to have it and i couldn't love anything more than them but if you did you'd give it up i'd have to hattie i couldn't oh yes you could if i could no no how do you know you couldn't because i haven't i i oughtn't to have gone on staying here my father's ill they wanted me to go to them and i wouldn't go oh prissy there you see but i couldn't i couldn't i was so happy here with you i couldn't give it up if your father had been like papa you would have yes i'd do anything for him because he's your father it's you i couldn't give up you'll have to some day when 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 somebody else comes when you're married i shall never marry never i shall never want anybody but you if we could always be together i can't think why people marry hattie still hattie said they do it's because they haven't ever cared as you and me care hattie if i don't marry anybody you won't will you i'm not thinking of marrying anybody no but promise promise on your honour you won't ever i'd rather not promise you see i might i shall love you all the same priscilla all my life no you won't it'll all be different i love you more than you love me but i shall love you all my life and it won't be different i shall never marry perhaps i shan't either harriet said they exchanged gifts harriet gave priscilla a rosewood writing-desk inlaid with mother-of-pearl and priscilla gave harriet a pocket-handkerchief case she had made herself of fine grey canvas embroidered with blue flowers like a sampler and lined with blue and white plaid silk on the top part you read pocket-handkerchiefs in blue lettering and on the bottom harriet freen 
and tucked away in one corner priscilla heaven september eighteen sixty one End of chapter 3. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 4 of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 4. She remembered the conversation her father sitting straight and slender in his chair talking in that quiet voice of his that never went sharp or deep or quavering that paused now and then on an amused inflection his long lips straightening between the perpendicular grooves of his smile she loved his straight slender face clean-shaven the straight slightly jutting jaw the dark blue flattish eyes under the black eyebrows the silver grizzled hair that fitted close like a cap curling in a silver brim above his ears he was talking about his business as if more than anything it amused him there's nothing gross and material about stockbroking it's like pure mathematics you're dealing in abstractions ideal values all the time you calculate in curves his hand holding the unlit cigar drew a curve a long graceful one in mid-air you know what's going to happen all the time the excitement begins when you don't quite know and you risk it when it's getting dangerous the higher mathematics of the game if you can afford them if you haven't a wife and family i can see the fascination he sat holding his cigar in one hand looking at it without seeing it seeing the fascination and smiling at it amused and secure and her mother bending over her beadwork smiled too out of their happiness their security he would lean back smoking his cigar and looking at them out of contented half-shut eyes as they stitched one at each end of the long canvas fender stool he was waiting he said for the moment when their heads would come bumping together in the middle sometimes they would sit like that not exchanging ideas exchanging only the sense of each other's presence a secure profound satisfaction that belonged as much to their bodies as their minds it rippled on their faces with their quiet smiling it breathed with their breath sometimes she or her mother read aloud mrs browning or charles dickens or the biography of some great man sitting there in the velvet curtain room or out on the lawn under the cedar tree a motionless communion broken by walks in the sweet-smelling fields and deep elm-screened lanes and there were short journeys into london to a lecture or a concert and now and then the surprise and excitement of the play one day her mother smoothed out her long hanging curls and tucked them away under a net harriet had a little shock of dismay and resentment hating change and the long long sundays spaced the weeks and the months hushed and sweet and rather enervating yet with a sort of thrill in them as if somewhere the music of the church organ went on vibrating her mother had some secret some happy sense of god that she gave to you and you took from her as you took food and clothing but not quite knowing what it was feeling that there was something more in it some hidden gladness some perfection that you missed her father had his secret too she felt that it was harder somehow darker and dangerous he read dangerous books darwin and huxley and herbert spencer sometimes he talked about them there's a sort of fascination in seeing how far you can go the fascination of truth might be just that the risk that after all it mayn't be true that you may have to go farther and farther perhaps never come back her mother looked up with her bright still eyes i trust the truth i know that however far you go you'll come back some day i believe you see all of them darwin and huxley and herbert spencer coming back he said yes i do his eyes smiled loving her but you could see it amused him too to think of them all those reckless courageous thinkers coming back to share her secret his thinking was just a dangerous game he played she looked at her father with a kind of awe as he sat there reading his book in danger and yet safe she wanted to know what that fascination was she took down herbert spencer and tried to read him she made a point of finishing every book she had begun for her pride couldn't bear being beaten 
her head grew hot and heavy she read the same sentences over and over again they had no meaning she couldn't understand a single word of herbert spencer he had beaten her as she put the book back in its place she said to herself i mustn't if i go on if i get to the interesting part i may lose my faith and soon she made herself believe that this was really the reason why she had given it up besides connie hancock there were lizzie pierce and sarah barmby exquisite pleasure to walk with lizzie pierce lizzie's walk was a sliding swooping dance of little pointed feet always as if she were going out to meet somebody her sharp black-eyed face darting and turning my dear he kept on doing this lizzie did it as if he was trying to sit on himself to keep him from flying off into space like a cork fancy proposing on three tumblers of soda water i might have been mrs pennefather but for that lizzie went about laughing laughing at everybody looking for something to laugh at everywhere now and then she would stop suddenly to contemplate the vision she had created if connie didn't wear a bustle or oh my dear if mr hancock did mr hancock clear firm laughter chiming and tinkling goodness to think how many ridiculous people there are in the world i believe you see something ridiculous in me only when only when she swung her parasol in time to her sing-song she wouldn't say when lizzie not not when i'm in my black lace fichu and the little round hat oh dear me no not then the little round hat lizzie wore one like it herself tilted forward perched on her chignon well then she pleaded lizzie's face darted its teasing mysterious smile she loved lizzie best of her friends after priscilla she loved her mockery and her teasing wit and there was lizzie's friend sarah barmby who lived in one of those little shabby villas on the london road and looked after her father she moved about the villa in an unseeing shambling way hitting herself against the furniture her face was heavy with a gentle brooding goodness and she had little eyes that blinked and twinkled in the heaviness as if something amused her at first you kept on wondering what the joke was till you saw it was only a habit sarah had she came when she could spare time from her father next to lizzie harriet loved sarah she loved her goodness and connie hancock bouncing about hospitably in the large rich house tea parties and dances at the hancocks she wasn't sure that she liked dancing there was something obscurely dangerous about it she was afraid of being lifted off her feet and swung on and on away from her safe happy life she was stiff and abrupt with her partners convinced that none of those men who liked connie hancock could like her and anxious to show them that she didn't expect them to she was afraid of what they were thinking and she would slip away early running down the garden to the gate at the bottom of the lane where her father waited for her she loved the still coldness of the night under the elms and the strong tight feel of her father's arm when she hung on it leaning towards him and his there we are as he drew her closer her mother would look up from the sofa and ask always the same question well did anything nice happen till at last she answered no did you think it would mamma you never know said her mother i know everything 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 that could happen at the hancocks dances her mother shook her head at her she knew that in secret mamma was glad but she answered the reproof it's mean of me to say that when i've eaten four of their ices they were strawberry and chocolate and vanilla all in one well they won't last much longer not at that rate her father said i meant the dances said her mother and sure enough soon after connie's engagement to young mr pennefather they ceased and the three friends connie and sarah and lizzie came and went she loved them and yet when they were there they broke something something secret and precious between her and her father and mother and when they were gone she felt the stir the happy movement of coming together again drawing in close close after the break we only want each other nobody else really mattered not even priscilla heaven year after year the same her mother parted her hair into two sleek wings she wore a rosette and lappets of black velvet and lace on a glistening beetle-backed chignon and harriet felt again her shock of resentment she hated to think of her mother subject to change and time and priscilla came year after year still loving still protesting that she would never marry yet they were glad when even priscilla had gone and left them to each other 
only each other year after year the same end of chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Five of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Five. Priscilla's last visit was followed by another passionate vow that she would never marry. Then, within three weeks, she wrote again, telling of her engagement to Robin Lethbridge. I haven't known him very long, and Mamma says it's too soon but he makes me feel as if i had known him all my life i know i said i wouldn't but i couldn't tell i didn't know it would be so different i couldn't have believed that anybody could be so happy you won't mind hattie we can love each other just the same incredible that priscilla who could be so beaten down and crushed by suffering should have risen to such an ecstasy her letters had a swinging lilt a hurried beat like a song bursting a heart beating for joy too fast it would have to be a long engagement robin was in a provincial bank he had his way to make then a year later prissy wrote and told them that robin had got a post in parsons bank in the city he didn't know a soul in london would they be kind to him and let him come to them sometimes on saturdays and sundays he came one sunday harriet had wondered what he would be like and he was tall slender-waisted wide-shouldered he had a square very white forehead his brown hair was parted on one side half curling at the tips above his ears his eyes thin black crystal shining turning showing speckles of brown and grey perfectly set under straight eyebrows laid very black on the white skin his round pouting chin had a dent in it the face in between was thin and irregular the nose straight and serious and rather long in profile with a dip and a rise at three quarters in full face straight again but shortened his eyes had another meaning deeper and steadier than his fine slender mouth but it was the mouth that made you look at him one arch of the bow was higher than the other now and then it quivered with an uneven sensitive movement of its own she noticed his mouth's little dragging droop at the corners and thought oh you're cross if you're cross with prissy if you make her unhappy but when he caught her looking at him the cross lips drew back in a sudden white confiding smile and when he spoke she understood why he had been irresistible to priscilla he had come three sundays now four perhaps she had lost count they were all sitting out on the lawn under the cedar suddenly as if he had only just thought of it he said it's extraordinarily good of you to have me oh well her mother said prissy is hattie's greatest friend i suppose that was why you do it he didn't want it to be that he wanted it to be himself himself he was proud he didn't like to owe anything to other people not even to prissy her father smiled at him you must give us time he would never give it or take it you could see him tearing at things in his impatience to know them to make them give themselves up to him at once he came rushing to give himself up all in a minute to make himself known it isn't fair he said i know you so much better than you know me priscilla's always talking about you but you don't know anything about me no we've got all the excitement and the risk sir and of course the risk he liked him she could talk to robin lethbridge as she couldn't talk to connie hancock's young men she wasn't afraid of what he was thinking she was safe with him he belonged to priscilla heaven he liked her because he loved priscilla but he wanted her to like him not because of priscilla but for himself she talked about priscilla i never saw anybody so loving it used to frighten me because you can hurt her so easily yes poor little prissy she's very vulnerable he said when priscilla came to stay it was almost painful her eyes clung to him and wouldn't let him go if he left the room she was restless unhappy till he came back she went out for long walks with him and returned silent with a tired beaten look she would lie on the sofa and he would hang over her gazing at her with strained unhappy eyes after she had gone he kept on coming more than ever and he stayed overnight harriet had to walk with him now he wanted to talk to talk about himself endlessly when she looked in the glass she saw a face she didn't know bright-eyed flushed pretty the little arrogant lift had gone 
as if it had been somebody else's face she asked herself in wonder without rancor why nobody had ever cared for it why why she could see her father looking at her intent as if he wondered and one day her mother said do you think you ought to see so much of robin do you think it's quite fair to prissy oh mamma i wouldn't i haven't i know you couldn't if you would hattie you would always behave beautifully but are you so sure about robin oh he couldn't care for anybody but prissy it's only because he's so safe with me because he knows i don't and he doesn't the wedding day was fixed for july after all they were going to risk it by the middle of june the wedding presents began to come in harriet and robin lethbridge were walking up black's lane the hedges were a white bridal froth of cow's parsley every now and then she swerved aside to pick the red campion he spoke suddenly do you know what a dear little face you have hattie it's so clear and still and it behaves so beautifully does it she thought of prissy's face dark and restless never clear never still you're not a bit like what i expected prissy doesn't know what you are you don't know yourself i know what she is his mouth's uneven quiver beat in and out like a pulse don't talk to me about prissy then he got it out he tore it out of himself he loved her oh robin her fingers loosened in her dismay she went dropping red campion it was no use he said to think about prissy he couldn't marry her he couldn't marry anybody but hattie hattie must marry him you can't say you don't love me hattie no she couldn't say it for it wouldn't be true well then i can't i'd be doing wrong robin i feel all the time as if she belonged to you as if she were married to you but she isn't it isn't the same thing to me it is you can't undo it it would be too dishonourable not half so dishonourable as marrying her when i don't love her yes as long as she loves you she hasn't anybody but you she was so happy so happy think of the cruelty of it think what we should send her back to you think of prissy you don't think of me because it would kill her how about you it can't kill us because we know we love each other nothing can take that from us but i couldn't be happy with her hattie she wears me out she's so restless we couldn't be happy robin we should always be thinking of what we did to her how could we be happy you know how well even if we were we've no right to get our happiness out of her suffering oh hattie why are you so good so good i'm not good it's only there are some things you can't do we couldn't we couldn't no he said at last i don't suppose we could whatever it's like i've got to go through with it he didn't stay that night she was crouching on the floor beside her father her arm thrown across his knees her mother had left them there papa do you know your mother told me you've done the right thing you don't think i've been cruel he said i didn't think of him oh no you couldn't do anything else she couldn't she couldn't it was no use thinking about him yet night after night for weeks and months she thought and cried herself to sleep by day she suffered from lizzie's sharp eyes and sarah's brooding pity and connie pennefather's callous married stare only with her father and mother she had peace end of chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six towards spring harriet showed signs of depression and they took her to the south of france and to bordighera in rome in rome she recovered rome was one of those places you ought to see and she had always been anxious to do the right thing in the little pension in the via babuino she had a sense of her own importance and the importance of her father and mother they were mr and mrs hilton freen and miss harriet freen seeing rome after their return in the summer he began to write his book the social order there were things that had to be said it did not much matter who said them provided they were said plainly he dreamed of a new social state society governing itself without representatives 
for a long time they lived on the interest and excitement of the book and when it came out harriet pasted all his reviews very neatly into an album he had the air of not taking them quite seriously but he subscribed to the spectator and sometimes an article appeared there understood to have been written by hilton freen and they went abroad again every year they went to florence and came home and read romola and mrs browning and dante and the spectator they went to assisi and read the little flowers of st francis they went to venice and read ruskin and the spectator they went to rome again and read gibbon's decline and fall of the roman empire harriet said we should have enjoyed rome more if we had read gibbon and her mother replied that they would not have enjoyed gibbon so much if they had not seen rome harriet did not really enjoy him but she enjoyed the sound of her own voice reading out the great sentences and the rolling latin names she had brought back photographs of the Colosseum and the forum and of botticelli's spring and adela robbia madonna in a shrine of fruit and flowers and hung them in the drawing-room and when she saw the blue egg in its gilt frame standing on the marble top table she wondered how she had ever loved it and wished it were not there it had been one of mamma's wedding presents mrs hancock had given it her but mr hancock must have bought it harriet's face had taken on again its arrogant lift she esteemed herself justly she knew she was superior to the hancocks and the pennefathers and to lizzie pierce and sarah barmby even to priscilla when she thought of robin and how she had given him up she felt a thrill of pleasure in her beautiful behaviour and a thrill of pride in remembering that he had loved her more than priscilla her mind refused to think of robin married two three five years passed with a perceptible acceleration and harriet was now thirty she had not seen them since the wedding day robin had gone back to his own town he was cashier in a big bank there for four years prissy's letters came regularly every month or so then ceased abruptly then robin wrote and told her of prissy's illness a mysterious paralysis it had begun with fits of giddiness in the street prissy would turn round and round on the pavement then falling fits and now both legs were paralyzed but robin thought she was gradually recovering the use of her hands harriet did not cry the shock of it stopped her tears she tried to see it and couldn't poor little prissy how terrible she kept on saying to herself she couldn't bear to think of prissy paralyzed poor little prissy and poor robin paralysis she saw the paralysis coming between them separating them and inside her the secret pain was soothed she need not think of robin married any more she was going to stay with them robin had written the letter he said prissy wanted her when she met him on the platform she had a little shock at seeing him changed changed his face was fuller and a dark moustache hid the sensitive uneven pulsing lip his mouth was dragged down further at the corners but he was the same robin in the cab going to the house he sat silent breathing hard she felt the tremor of his consciousness and knew that he still loved her more than he loved priscilla poor little prissy how terrible priscilla sat by the fireplace in a wheelchair she became agitated when she saw harriet her arms shook as she lifted them for the embrace hattie you've hardly changed a bit her voice shook poor little prissy she was thin thinner than ever and stiff as if she had withered her face was sallow and dry and the lustre had gone from her black hair her wide mouth twitched and wavered wavered and twitched though it was warm summer she sat by a blazing fire with the windows behind her shut through dinner harriet and robin were silent and constrained she tried not to see prissy shaking and jerking and spilling soup down the front of her gown robin's face was smooth and blank he pretended to be absorbed in his food so as not to look at prissy it was as if prissy's old restlessness had grown into that ceaseless jerking and twitching and her eyes fastened on robin they clung to him and wouldn't let him go she kept on asking him to do things for her robin you might get me my shawl and robin would go and get the shawl and put it round her whenever he did anything for her prissy's face would settle down into a quivering deep content at nine o'clock he lifted her out of her wheelchair harriet saw his stoop and the taut braced power of his back as he lifted prissy lay in his arms with rigid limbs hanging from loose attachments inert like a doll as he carried her upstairs to bed 
her face had a queer exalted look of pleasure and of triumph harriet and robin sat alone together in his study how long is it since we've seen each other five years robin it isn't it can't be it is i suppose it is but i can't believe it i can't believe i'm married i can't believe prissie's ill it doesn't seem real with you sitting there nothing's changed robin except that you're more serious nothing's changed except that i'm more serious than ever do you still do the same things do you still sit in the curly chair holding your work up to your chin with your little pointed hands like a squirrel do you still see the same people i don't make new friends robin he seemed to settle down after that smiling at his own thoughts appeased lying in her bed in the spare room harriet heard the opening and shutting of robin's door she still thought of prissie's paralysis as separating them still felt inside her a secret unacknowledged satisfaction poor little prissie how terrible her pity for priscilla went through and through her in wave after wave her pity was sad and beautiful and at the same time it appeased her pain in the morning priscilla told her about her illness the doctors didn't understand it she ought to have had a stroke and she hadn't had one there was no reason why she shouldn't walk except that she couldn't it seemed to give her pleasure to go over it from her first turning round and round in the street with helpless shaking laughter at the queerness of it to the moment when robin bought her the wheelchair robin robin i minded most because of robin it's such an awful illness hattie i can't move when i'm in bed robin has to get up and turn me a dozen times in one night robin's a perfect saint he does everything for me prissie's voice and her face softened and thickened with voluptuous content do you know hattie i had a little baby it died the day it was born perhaps some day i shall have another harriet was aware of a sudden tightening of her heart of a creeping depression that weighed on her brain and worried it she thought this was her pity for priscilla her third night all evening robin had been moody and morose he would hardly speak to either harriet or priscilla when priscilla asked him to do anything for her he got up heavily pulled himself together with a sigh with a look of weary irritated patience prissie wheeled herself out of the study into the drawing-room beckoning harriet to follow she had the air of saving robin from harriet of intimating that his grumpiness was harriet's fault he doesn't want to be bothered she said she sat up till eleven so that robin shouldn't be thrown with harriet in the last hours half the night harriet's thoughts ran on now in a darkness now in thin flashes of light supposing after all robin wasn't happy supposing he can't stand it supposing but why is he angry with me then a clear thought he's angry with me because he can't be angry with priscilla and clearer he's angry with me because i made him marry her she stopped the running and meditated with a steady hard deliberation she thought of her deep spiritual love for robin of robin's deep spiritual love for her of his strength in shouldering his burden it was through her renunciation that he had grown so strong so pure so good something had gone wrong with prissy robin coming home early on saturday afternoon had taken harriet for a walk all evening and all through sunday it was priscilla who sulked and snapped when harriet spoke to her on monday morning she was ill and robin ordered her to stay in bed monday was harriet's last night priscilla stayed in bed till six o'clock when she heard robin come in then she insisted on being dressed and carried downstairs harriet heard her calling to robin and robin saying i told you you weren't to get up till tomorrow and to sound like prissy crying at dinner she shook and jerked and spilt things worse than ever robin gloomed at her you know you ought to be in bed you'll go at nine if i go you'll go you've got a headache i should think i had sitting in this furnace the heat of the dining-room oppressed him but they sat on there after dinner because prissy loved the heat robin's pale blank face had a sick look a deadly smoothness he had to lie down on the sofa in the window when the clock struck nine he sighed and got up dragging himself as if the weight of his body was more than he could bear he stooped over prissy and lifted her robin you can't you're dropping to pieces i'm all right he heaved her up with one tremendous irritated effort and carried her upstairs fast as if he wanted to be done with it through the open doors harriet could hear prissy's pleading whine 
and robin's voice hard and controlled presently he came back to her and they went into his study they could breathe there he said they sat without speaking for a little time the silence of prissie's room overhead came between them robin spoke first i'm afraid it hasn't been very gay for you with poor prissie in this state poor prissie she's very happy robin he stared at her his eyes round and full and steady taxed her with falsehood with hypocrisy you don't suppose i'm not do you no there was a movement in her throat as though she swallowed something hard no i want you to be happy you don't you want me to be rather miserable robin she contrived a sound like laughter but robin didn't laugh his eyes morose and cynical held her there that's what you want at least i hope you do if you didn't she fenced off the danger do you want me to be miserable then at that he laughed out no i don't i don't care how happy you are she took the pain of it the pain he meant to give her that evening he hung over priscilla with a deliberate exaggerated tenderness dear dearest he spoke the words to priscilla but he sent out his voice to harriet she could feel its false precision its intention its repulse of her she was glad to be gone End of chapter 6 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7 of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7 1879 It was the year her father lost his money harriet was nearly thirty-five she remembered the day late in november when they heard him coming home from the office early her mother raised her head and said that's your father harriet he must be ill she always thought of seventy-nine as one continuous november her father and mother were alone in the study for a long time she remembered annie going in with the lamp and coming out and whispering that they wanted her she found them sitting in the lamplight alone close together holding each other's hands their faces had a strange exalted look harriet my dear i've lost every shilling i possessed and here's your mother saying she doesn't mind he began to explain in his quiet voice when all the creditors are paid in full there'll be nothing but your mother's two hundred a year and the insurance money when i'm gone oh papa how terrible yes hattie i mean the insurance it's gambling with your life my dear if that was all i'd gambled with it seemed that half his capital had gone in what he called the higher mathematics of the game the creditors would get the rest we shall be no worse off her mother said than we were when we began we were very happy then we how about harriet harriet isn't going to mind you're not going to mind we shall have to sell this house and live in a smaller one and i can't take my business up again my dear i'm glad and thankful you've done with that dreadful dangerous game i'd no business to play it but after holding myself in all those years there was a sort of fascination one of the creditors mr hitchens gave him work in his office he was now mr hitchens's clerk he went to mr hitchens as he had gone to his own great business upright and alert handsome in his dark grey overcoat with the black velvet collar faintly amused at himself he would never have known that anything had happened strange that at the same time mr hancock should have lost money a great deal of money more money than papa he seemed determined that everybody should know it you couldn't pass him in the road without knowing he met you with his swollen red face hanging ashamed and miserable and angry as if it had been your fault one day harriet came in to her father and mother with the news did you know that mr hancock sold his horses and he's going to give up the house her mother signed to her to be silent frowning and shaking her head and glancing at her father he got up suddenly and left the room he's worrying himself to death about mr hancock she said i didn't know he cared for him like that mamma oh well he's known him thirty years and it's a very dreadful thing he should have to give up his house it's not worse for him than it is for papa it's ever so much worse he isn't like your father he can't be happy without his big house and his carriages and horses he'll feel so small and unimportant well then it serves him right don't say that it is what he cares for and he's lost it 
he's no business to behave as if it was papa's fault said harriet she had no patience with the odious little man she thought of her father's face her father's body straight and calm and his soul so far above that mean trouble of mr hancock's that vulgar shame yet inside him he fretted and suddenly he began to sink he turned faint after the least exertion and had to leave off going to mr hitchens and by the spring of eighteen eighty he was upstairs in his room too ill to be moved that was just after mr hitchens had bought the house and wanted to come into it he lay patient in the big white bed smiling his faint amused smile when he thought of mr hitchens it was awful to harriet that her father should be ill lying there at their mercy she couldn't get over her sense of his parenthood his authority when he was obstinate and insisted on exerting himself she gave in she was a bad nurse because she couldn't set herself against his will and when she had him under her hands to strip and wash him she felt that she was doing something outrageous and impious she set about it with a flaming face and fumbling hands your mother does it better he said gently but she could not get her mother's feeling of him as a helpless dependent thing mr hitchens called every week to inquire poor man he wants to know when he can have his house why will he always come on my good days he isn't giving himself a chance he still had good days days when he could be helped out of bed to sit in his chair this sort of game may go on forever he said he began to worry seriously about keeping mr hitchens out of his house it isn't decent of me it isn't decent harriet was ill with the strain of it she had to go away for a fortnight with lizzie pierce and sarah barmby stayed with her mother mrs barmby had died the year before when harriet got back her father was making plans for his removal why have you all made up your minds that it'll kill me to remove me it won't the men can take everything out but me and my bed and that chair and when they've got all the things into the other house they can come back for the chair and me and i can sit in the chair while they're bringing the bed it's quite simple it only wants a little system then while they wondered whether they might risk it he got worse he lay propped up rigid his arms stretched out by his side afraid to lift a hand because of the violent movements of his heart his face had a patient expectant look as if he waited for them to do something they couldn't do anything there would be no more rallies he might die any day now the doctor said he may die any minute i certainly don't expect him to live through the night harriet followed her mother back into the room he was sitting up in his attitude of rigid expectancy no movement but the quivering of his nightshirt above his heart the doctor's been gone a long time hasn't he he said harriet was silent she didn't understand her mother was looking at her with a serene comprehension and compassion poor hattie he said she can't tell a lie to save my life oh papa he smiled as if he was thinking of something that amused him you should consider other people my dear not just your own selfish feelings you ought to write and tell mr hitchens her mother gave a short sobbing laugh oh you darling she said he lay still then suddenly he began pressing hard on the mattress with both hands bracing himself up in the bed her mother leaned closer towards him he threw himself over slantways and with his head bent as if it was broken dropped into her arms harriet wondered why he was making that queer grating and coughing noise three times her mother called softly to her harriet she began to tremble End of chapter seven Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. Chapter eight of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter eight. Her mother had some secret that she couldn't share. She was wonderful in her pure, high serenity surely she had some secret she said he was closer to her now than he had ever been and in her correct precise answers to the letters of condolence harriet wrote i feel that he is closer to us now than he ever was but she didn't really feel it she only felt that to feel it was the beautiful and proper thing she looked for her mother's secret and couldn't find it meanwhile mr hitchens had given them six weeks they had to decide where they would go into devonshire or into a cottage at hampstead 
where sarah barmby lived now her mother said do you think you'd like to live in sidmouth near aunt harriet they had stayed one summer at sidmouth with aunt harriet she remembered the red cliffs the sea and aunt harriet's garden stuffed with flowers they had been happy there she thought she would love that the sea and the red cliffs and a garden like aunt harriet's but she was not sure whether it was what her mother really wanted mamma would never say she would have to find out somehow well what do you think it would be leaving all your friends hattie my friends yes but lizzie and sarah and connie pennefather she could live without them oh there's mrs hancock well her mother's voice suggested that if she were put to it she could live without mrs hancock and harriet thought she does want to go to sidmouth then it would be very nice to be near aunt harriet she was afraid to say more than that lest she should show her own wish before she knew her mother's aunt harriet yes but it's very far away hattie we should be cut off from everything lectures and concerts we couldn't afford to come up and down no we couldn't she could see that mamma did not really want to live in sidmouth she didn't want to be near aunt harriet she wanted the cottage at hampstead and all the things of their familiar intellectual life going on and on after all that was the way to keep near to papa to go on doing the things they had done together her mother agreed that it was the way i can't help feeling harriet said it's what he would have wished her mother's face was quiet and content she hadn't guessed they left the white house with the green balcony hung out like a birdcage at the side and turned into the cottage at hampstead the rooms were small and rather dark and the furniture they had brought had a squeezed up unhappy look the blue egg on the marble top table was conspicuous and hateful as it had never been in the black's lane drawing-room harriet and her mother looked at it must it stay there i think so fanny hancock gave it me mamma you know you don't like it no but after all these years i couldn't turn the poor thing away her mother was an old woman clinging with an old stubborn fidelity to the little things of her past but harriet denied it she's not old she said to herself not really old harriet her mother said one day i think you ought to do the housekeeping oh mamma why she hated the idea of this change because you'll have to do it some day she obeyed but as she went her rounds and gave her orders she felt that she was doing something not quite real playing at being her mother as she had played when she was a child then her mother had another thought harriet i think you ought to see more of your friends dear why because you'll want them after i'm gone i shall never want anybody but you and their time went as it had gone before in sewing together reading together listening to lectures and concerts together they had told sarah that they didn't want anybody to call they were hilton freen's wife and daughter after our wonderful life with him they said you'll understand sarah that we don't want people and if harriet was introduced to any stranger she accounted for herself arrogantly my father was hilton freen they were collecting his remains for publication months passed years passed going each one a little quicker than the last and harriet was thirty-nine one evening coming out of church her mother fainted that was the beginning of her illness february eighteen eighty three first came the long months of weakness then the months and months of sickness then the pain the pain she had been hiding that she couldn't hide any more they knew what it was now that horrible thing that even the doctors were afraid to name they called it something malignant when the friends mrs hancock connie pennefather lizzie and sarah called to inquire harriet wouldn't tell them what it was she pretended that she didn't know that the doctors weren't sure she covered it up from them as if it had been a secret shame and they pretended that they didn't know but they knew they were talking now about an operation there was one chance for her in a hundred if they had sir james pargeter one chance she might die of it she might die under the anaesthetic she might die of shock she was so old and weak still there was that one chance if only she would take it but her mother wouldn't listen my dear it would cost a hundred pounds how do you know what it would cost oh she said i know she was smiling above the sheet that was tucked close up tight under her chin shutting it all down sir james pargeter would cost a hundred pounds harriet couldn't lay her hands on the money or on half of it or a quarter 
that doesn't matter if they think it'll save you they think they think but i know i know better than all the doctors but mamma darling she urged the operation just because it would be so difficult to raise the hundred pounds she urged it she wanted to feel that she had done everything that could be done that she had let nothing stand in the way that she had shrunk from no sacrifice one chance in a hundred what was a hundred pounds weighed against that one chance if it had been one in a thousand she would have said the same it would be no good hattie i know it wouldn't they just love to try experiments those doctors they're dying to get their knives into me don't let them gradually day by day harriet weakened her mother's frightened voice tore at her broke her down supposing she really died under the operation supposing it was cruel to excite and upset her just for that it made the pain worse either the operation or the pain going on and on stabbing with sharper and sharper knives cutting in deeper all their care the antiseptics the restoratives dragging it out giving it more time to torture her when the three friends came harriet said i shall be glad and thankful when it's all over i couldn't want to keep her with me just for this yet she did want it she was thankful every morning that she came to her mother's bed and found her alive lying there looking at her with her wonderful smile she was glad because she still had her and now they were giving her morphia under the torpor of the drug her face changed the muscles loosened the flesh sagged the widened swollen mouth hung open only the broad beautiful forehead the beautiful calm eyebrows were the same the face sallow white half imbecile was a mask flung aside she couldn't bear to look at it it wasn't her mother's face her mother had died already under the morphia she had a shock every time she came in and found it still there on the day her mother died she told herself she was glad and thankful she met her friends with a little quiet composed face saying i'm glad and thankful she's at peace but she wasn't thankful she wasn't glad she wanted her back again and she reproached herself one minute for having been glad and the next for wanting her she consoled herself by thinking of the sacrifices she had made how she had given up sidmouth and how willingly she would have paid the hundred pounds i sometimes think hattie said mrs hancock melancholy and condoling that it would have been very different if your poor mother could have had her wish what what wish her wish to live in sidmouth near your aunt harriet and sarah barmby sympathizing heavily stopped short and brooding trying to think of something to say if the operation had only been done three years ago when they knew it would save her three years ago but we didn't know anything about it then she did don't you remember it was when i stayed with her oh hattie didn't she tell you she never said a word oh well she wouldn't hear of it even then when they didn't give her two years to live three years she had had it three years ago she had known about it all that time three years ago the operation would have saved her she would have been here now why had she refused it when she knew it would save her she had been thinking of the hundred pounds to have known about it three years and said nothing to have gone believing she hadn't two years to live that was her secret that was why she had been so calm when papa died she had known she would have him again so soon not two years if i'd been them lizzie was saying i'd have bitten my tongue out before i told you it's no use worrying hattie you did everything that could be done i know i know she held up her face against them but to herself she said that everything had not been done her mother had never had her wish and she had died in agony so that she harriet might keep her hundred pounds end of chapter eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Nine of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Nine. In all her previsions of the event, she had seen herself surviving as the same Harriet Freen, with the addition of an overwhelming grief. She was horrified at this image of herself persisting beside her mother's place, empty in space and time but she was not there through her absorption in her mother some large essential part of herself had gone 
it had not been so when her father died what he had absorbed was given back to her transferred to her mother all her memories of her mother were joined to the memory of this now irrecoverable self she tried to reinstate herself through grief she sheltered behind her bereavement affecting a more profound seclusion abhorring strangers she was more than ever the reserved fastidious daughter of hilton freen she had always thought of herself as different from connie and sarah living with a superior intellectual life she turned to the books she had read with her mother dante browning carlyle and ruskin the biographies of great men trying to retrace the footsteps of her lost self to revive the forgotten thrill but it was no use one day she found herself reading the dedication of the ring and the book over and over again without taking in its meaning without any remembrance of its poignant secret and all a wonder and a wild desire mamma loved that she thought she loved it too but what she loved was the dark green book she had seen in her mother's long white hands and the sound of her mother's voice reading she had followed her mother's mind with strained attention and anxiety smiling when she smiled but with no delight and no admiration of her own if only she could have remembered it was only through memory that she could reinstate herself she had a horror of the empty house her friends advised her to leave it but she had a horror of removal of change she loved the rooms that had held her mother the chair she had sat on the white fluted cup she had drunk from in her illness she clung to the image of her mother and always beside it shadowy and pathetic she discerned the image of her lost self when the horror of emptiness came over her she dressed herself in her black with delicate care and precision and visited her friends even in moments of no intention she would find herself knocking at lizzie's door or sarah's or connie pennefather's if they were not in she would call again and again till she found them she would sit for hours talking spinning out the time she began to look forward to these visits wonderful the sweet peas she had planted had come up hitherto harriet had looked on the house and garden as parts of the space that contained her without belonging to her she had had no sense of possession this morning she was arrested by the thought that the plot she had planted was hers the house and garden were hers she began to take an interest in them she found that by a system of punctual movements she could give to her existence the reasonable appearance of an aim next spring a year after her mother's death she felt the vague stirring of her individual soul she was free to choose her own vicar she left her mother's dr braithwaite who was broad and twice married and went to canon wrench who was unmarried and high there was something stimulating in the short happy service the rich music the incense and the processions she made new covers for the drawing-room in cretonne a gay pattern of pomegranate and blue-green leaves and as she had always the cutlets broiled plain because her mother liked them that way now she had them breaded and mrs hancock wanted to know why harriet had forsaken her dear mother's church and when connie pennefather saw the covers she told harriet she was lucky to be able to afford new cretonne it was more than she could she seemed to think harriet had no business to afford it as for the breaded cutlets hannah opened her eyes and said that was how the mistress always had em ma'am when you was away one day she took the blue egg out of the drawing-room and stuck it on the chimney-piece in the spare room when she remembered how she used to love it she felt that she had done something cruel and iniquitous but necessary to the soul she was taking out novels from the circulating library now not she explained for her serious reading her serious reading her dante her browning her great man lay always on the table ready to her hand beside a copy of the social order and the remains of hilton freen while secretly and half ashamed she played with some frivolous tale she was satisfied with anything that ended happily and had nothing in it that was unpleasant or difficult demanding thought she exalted her preferences into high canons a novel ought to conform to her requirements a novelist she thought of him with some asperity had no right to be obscure or depressing or to add needless unpleasantness to the unpleasantness that had to be the great men didn't do it she spoke of george eliot and dickens and mr thackeray lizzie pierce had a provoking way of smiling at harriet 
as if she found her ridiculous and harriet had no patience with lizzie's affectation in wanting to be modern her vanity in trying to be young her middle-aged raptures over the work often unpleasant of writers too young to be worth serious consideration they had long arguments in which harriet beaten retired behind the social order and the remains it's silly lizzie said not to be able to look at a new thing because it's new that's the way you grow old it's sillier harriet said to be always running after new things because you think that's the way to look young i've no wish to appear younger than i am i've no wish to appear suffering from senile decay there is a standard harriet lifted her obstinate and arrogant chin you forget that i'm hilton freen's daughter i'm william pierce's but that hasn't prevented my being myself lizzie's mind had grown keener in her sharp middle age as it played about her harriet cowered it was like being exposed naked to a cutting wind her mind ran back to her father and mother longing like a child for their shelter and support for the blessed assurance of herself at her worst she could still think with pleasure of the beauty of the act which had given robin to priscilla end of chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten my dear harriet thank you for your kind letter of sympathy although we had expected the end for many weeks poor prissy's death came to us as a great shock but for her it was a blessed release and we can only be thankful you who knew her will realize the depth and extent of my bereavement i have lost the dearest and most loving wife man ever had poor little prissy she couldn't bear to think she would never see her again six months later robin wrote again from sidmouth dear harriet priscilla left you this locket in her will as a remembrance i would have sent it before but that i couldn't bear to part with her things all at once i take this opportunity of telling you that i am going to be married again her heart heaved and closed she could never have believed she could have felt such a pang the lady is miss beatrice walker the devoted nurse who was with my dear wife all through her last illness this step may seem strange and precipitate coming so soon after her death but i am urged to do it by the precarious state of my own health and by the knowledge that we are fulfilling poor prissy's dying wish poor prissy's dying wish after what she had done for prissy if she had a dying wish but neither of them had thought of her robin had forgotten her forgotten forgotten but no priscilla had remembered she had left her the locket with his hair in it she had remembered and she had been afraid jealous of her she couldn't bear to think that robin might marry her even after she was dead she had made him marry this walker woman so that he shouldn't oh but he wouldn't not after twenty years i didn't really think he would she was forty-five her face was lined and pitted and her hair was dust-colour streaked with grey and she could only think of robin as she had last seen him young a young face a young body young shining eyes he would want to marry a young woman he had been in love with this walker woman and prissy had known it she could see prissy lying in her bed helpless looking at them over the edge of the white sheet she had known that as soon as she was dead before the sods closed over her grave they would marry nothing could stop them and she had tried to make herself believe it was her wish her doing not theirs poor little prissy she understood that robin had been staying in sidmouth for his health a year later harriet run down was ordered to the seaside she went to sidmouth she told herself that she wanted to see the place where she had been so happy with her mother where poor aunt harriet had died looking through the local paper she found in the list of residents sidcote mr and mrs robert lethbridge and miss walker she wrote to robin and asked if she might call on his wife a mile of hot road through the town and inland brought her to a door in a lane in a thatched cottage with a little lawn behind it from the doorstep she could see two figures a man and a woman lying back in garden chairs 
inside the house she heard the persistent energetic sound of hammering the woman got up and came to her she was young pink-faced and golden-haired and she said she was miss walker mrs lethbridge's sister a tall lean grey man rose from the garden chair slowly dragging himself with an invalid air his eyes stared groping blurred films that trembled between the pouch and droop of the lids long cheeks deep grooved dropped to the infirm mouth that sagged under the limp moustache that was robin he became agitated when he saw her poor robin she thought all these years and it's too much for him seeing me presently he dragged himself from the lawn to the house and disappeared through the french window where the hammering came from have i frightened him away she said oh no he's always like that when he sees strange faces my face isn't exactly strange well he must have thought it was a sudden chill crept through her he'll be all right when he gets used to you miss walker said the strange face of miss walker chilled her a strange young woman living close to robin protecting him explaining robin's ways the sound of hammering ceased through the long open window she saw a woman rise up from the floor and shed a white apron she came down the lawn to them with raised arms patting disordered hair large a full firm figure clipped in blue linen a full-blown face bluish pink thick grey eyes slightly protruding a thick mouth solid and firm and kind that was robin's wife her sister was slighter fresher a good ten years younger harriet thought excuse me we're only just settling in i was nailing down the carpet in robin's study her lips were so thick that they moved stiffly when she spoke or smiled she panted a little as if from extreme exertion when they were all seated mrs lethbridge addressed her sister robin was quite right it looks much better turned the other way do you mean to say he made you take it all up and put it down again well what's the use miss freen you don't know what it is to have a husband who will have things just so she had to mow the lawn this morning because robin can't bear to see one blade of grass higher than another is he as particular as all that i assure you miss freen he is miss walker informed her he wasn't when i knew him harriet said ah my sister spoils him mrs lethbridge wondered why he hadn't come out again i think harriet said perhaps he'll come if i go oh you mustn't go it's good for him to see people takes him out of himself he'll turn up all right miss walker said when he hears the teacups and at four o'clock when the teacups came robin turned up dragging himself slowly from the house to the lawn he blinked and quivered with agitation harriet saw he was annoyed not with her and not with miss walker but with his wife beatrice what have you done with my new bottle of medicine nothing dear you've done nothing when you know you poured out my last dose at twelve why hasn't it come no it hasn't but sissy ordered it this morning i didn't sissy said i forgot oh sissy you needn't blame sissy you ought to have seen to it yourself she was a good nurse harriet before she was my wife my dear your nurse had nothing else to do your wife has to clean and mend for you and cook your dinner and mow the lawn and nail the carpets down while she said it she looked at robin as if she adored him all through tea-time he talked about his health and about the sanitary dustbin they hadn't got something had happened to him it wasn't like him to be wrapped up in himself and to talk about dustbins he spoke to his wife as if she had been his valet he didn't see that she was perspiring worn out by her struggle with the carpet just go and fetch me another cushion beatrice she rose with tired patience you might let her have her tea in peace miss walker said but she was gone before they could stop her when harriet left she went with her to the garden gate panting as she walked harriet noticed pale blurred lines on the edges of her lips she thought she isn't a bit strong she praised the garden mrs lethbridge smiled robin loves it but you should have seen it at five o'clock this morning five o'clock yes i always get up at five to make robin a cup of tea harriet's last evening she was dining at sidcote on her way there she had overtaken robin's wife wheeling robin in a bath chair beatrice had panted and perspired and had made mute signs to harriet not to take any notice 
she had had to go and lie down till robin sent for her to find his cigarette case now she was in the kitchen cooking robin's part of the dinner while he lay down in his study harriet talked to miss walker in the garden it's been very kind of you to have us so much oh but we've loved having you it's so good for beatie gives her a rest from robin i don't mean that she wants a rest but you see she's not well she looks a big strong bouncing thing but she isn't her heart's weak she oughtn't to be doing what she does doesn't robin see it he doesn't see anything he never knows when she's tired or got a headache she'll drop dead before he'll see it he's utterly selfish miss freen wrapped up in himself and his horrid little ailments whatever happens to beatty he must have his sweetbread and his soup at eleven and his tea at five in the morning i suppose you think i might help more well harriet did think it well i just won't i won't encourage robin he ought to get her a proper servant and a man for the garden and the bath chair i wish you'd give him a hint tell him she isn't strong i can't she'd snap my head off would you mind harriet didn't mind she didn't mind what she said she wouldn't be saying it to robin but to the contemptible thing that had taken robin's place she still saw robin as a young man with young shining eyes who came rushing to give himself up at once to make himself known she had no affection for this selfish invalid this weak peevish bully poor beatrice she was sorry for beatrice she resented his behaviour to beatrice she told herself she wouldn't be beatrice she wouldn't be robin's wife for the world her pity for beatrice gave her a secret pleasure and satisfaction after dinner she sat out in the garden talking to robin's wife while sissy walker played draughts with robin in his study giving beatrice a rest from him they talked about robin you knew him when he was young didn't you what was he like she didn't want to tell her she wanted to keep the young shining robin to herself she also wanted to show that she had known him that she had known a robin that beatrice would never know therefore she told her my poor robin beatrice gazed wistfully trying to see this robin that priscilla had taken from her that harriet had known then she turned her back it doesn't matter i've married the man i wanted she let herself go sissy says i've spoiled him that isn't true it was his first wife who spoiled him she made a nervous wreck of him he was devoted to her yes and he's paying for his devotion now she wore him out sissy says he's selfish if he is it's because he's used up all his unselfishness he was living on his moral capital i feel as if i couldn't do too much for him after what he did sissy doesn't know how awful his life was with priscilla she was the most exacting she was my friend wasn't robin your friend too yes but poor prissy she was paralyzed it wasn't paralysis what was it then pure hysteria robin wasn't in love with her and she knew it she developed that illness so that she might have a hold on him get his attention fastened on her somehow i don't say she could help it she couldn't but that's what it was well she died of it no she died of pneumonia after influenza i'm not blaming prissy she was pitiable but he ought never to have married her i don't think you ought to say that you know what he was said robin's wife and look at him now but harriet's mind refused obstinately to connect the two robins and priscilla she remembered that she had to speak to robin they went together into his study sissy sent her a look a signal and rose she stood by the doorway beady you might come here a minute harriet was alone with robin well harriet we haven't been able to do much for you in my beastly state you'll get better never i'm done for harriet i don't complain you've got a devoted wife robin yes poor girl she does what she can she does too much my dear woman she wouldn't be happy if she didn't it isn't good for her does it never strike you that she's not strong not strong she's 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 almost indecently robust what wouldn't i give to have her strength she looked at him at the lean figure sunk in the armchair at the dragged infirm face the blurred owlish eyes the expression of abject self-pity of self-absorption that was robin the awful thing was that she couldn't love him couldn't go on being faithful this injured her self-esteem end chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Chapter Eleven of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Eleven. Her old servant Hannah had gone, and her new servant Maggie had had a baby. After the first shock and three months' loss of Maggie, it occurred to Harriet that the beautiful thing would be to take Maggie back and let her have the baby with her, since she couldn't leave it the baby lay in his cradle in the kitchen black-eyed and rosy doubling up his fat naked knees smiling his crooked smile and saying things to himself harriet had to see him every time she came into the kitchen sometimes she heard him cry an intolerable cry tearing the nerves and heart and sometimes she saw maggie unbutton her black gown in a hurry and put out her white rose-pointed breast to still his cry harriet couldn't bear it she could not bear it she decided that maggie must go maggie was not doing her work properly harriet found fluff under the bed i'm sure maggie said i'm doing no worse than i did ma'am and you usen't to complain no worse isn't good enough maggie i think you might have tried to please me it isn't every one who would have taken you in the circumstances if you think that ma'am it's very cruel and unkind of you to send me away you've only yourself to thank there's no more to be said no ma'am i understand why i'm leaving it's because of baby you don't want to have him and i think you might have said so before that day month maggie packed her brown painted wooden box and the cradle and the perambulator the greengrocer took them away on a handcart through the drawing-room window harriet saw maggie going away carrying the baby pink and round in his white knitted cap his fat hips bulging over her arm under his white shawl the gate fell to behind them the click struck at harriet's heart three months later maggie turned up again in a black hat and gown for best red-eyed and humble i came to see ma'am whether you'd take me back as i haven't got baby now you haven't got him he died ma'am last month i'd put him with a woman in the country she was highly recommended to me very highly recommended she was and i paid her six shillings a week but i think she must have done something she shouldn't oh maggie you don't mean she was cruel to him no ma'am she was very fond of him everybody was fond of baby but whether it was the food she gave him or what he was that wasted you wouldn't have known him you remember what he was like when he was here i remember she remembered she remembered fat and round in his white shawl and knitted cap when maggie carried him down the garden path i should think she'd have done something shouldn't you ma'am she thought no no it was i who did it when i sent him away i don't know maggie i'm afraid it's been very terrible for you yes ma'am i wondered whether you'd give me another trial ma'am are you quite sure you want to come to me maggie yes am i'm sure you'd have kept him if you could have borne to see him about you know maggie that was not the reason why you left if i take you back you must try not to be careless and forgetful i shan't have nothing to make me before it was first baby's father and then him she could see that maggie didn't hold her responsible after all why should she if maggie had made bad arrangements for her baby maggie was responsible she went round to lizzie and sarah to see what they thought sarah thought well it was rather a difficult question and harriet resented her hesitation not at all it rested with maggie to go or stay if she was incompetent i wasn't bound to keep her just because she'd had a baby at that rate i should have been completely in her power lizzie said she thought maggie's baby would have died in any case and they both hoped that harriet wasn't going to be morbid about it harriet felt sustained she wasn't going to be morbid all the same the episode left her with a feeling of insecurity End chapter eleven recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Twelve of Life and Death of Harriet Freen by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Twelve. The young girl, Robin's niece, had come again, bright-eyed, eager, and hungry, grateful for Sunday supper. Harriet was getting used to these appearances spread over three years since Robin's wife had asked her to be kind to Mona Floyd. Mona had come this time to tell her of her engagement to Geoffrey Carter. The news shocked Harriet intensely. But 
my dear you told me he was going to marry your little friend amy amy lambert what does amy say to it what can she say i know it's a bit rough on her you know and yet you'll take your happiness at the poor child's expense we've got to we can't do anything else oh my dear if she could stop it an inspiration came i knew a girl once who might have done what you're doing only she wouldn't she gave the man up rather than hurt her friend she couldn't do anything else how much was he in love with her i don't know how much he was never in love with any other woman then she was a fool a silly fool didn't she think of him didn't she think no she didn't she thought of herself of her own moral beauty she was a selfish fool she asked the best and wisest man she knew and he told her she couldn't do anything else the best and wisest man oh lord that was my own father mona hilton freen then it was you you and uncle robin and aunt prissie harriet's face smiled its straight thin-lipped smile the worn grooved chin arrogantly lifted how could you i could because i was brought up not to think of myself before other people then it wasn't even your own idea you sacrificed him to somebody else's you made three people miserable just for that four if you count aunt beatty there was prissy i did it for her what did you do for her you insulted aunt prissy insulted her my dear mona it was an insult handing her over to a man who couldn't love her even with his body aunt prissy was the miserablest of the lot do you suppose he didn't take it out of her he never let her know oh didn't he she knew all right that's how she got her illness and it's how he got his and he'll kill aunt beatty he's taking it out of her now look at the awful suffering and you can go on sentimentalizing about it the young girl rose flinging her scarf over her shoulders with a violent gesture there's no common sense in it no common sense perhaps it's a jolly sight better than sentiment when it comes to marrying they kissed mona turned at the doorway i say did he go on caring for you sometimes i think he did sometimes i think he hated me of course he hated you after what you'd let him in for she paused you don't mind my telling you the truth do you harriet sat a long time her hands folded on her lap her eyes staring into the room trying to see the truth she saw the girl robin's niece in her young indignation her tender brilliance suddenly hard suddenly cruel flashing out the truth was it true that she had sacrificed robin and priscilla and beatrice to her parents idea of moral beauty was it true that this idea had been all wrong that she might have married robin and been happy and been right i don't care if it was to be done again to-morrow i'd do it but the beauty of that unique act no longer appeared to her as it once was uplifting consoling incorruptible the years passed they went with an incredible rapidity and harriet was now fifty the feeling of insecurity had grown on her it had something to do with mona with maggie and maggie's baby she had no clear illumination only a mournful acquiescence in her own futility an almost physical sense of shrinkage the crumbling away bit by bit of her beautiful and honourable self dying with the objects of its three profound affections her father her mother robin gradually the image of the middle-aged robin had effaced his youth she read more and more novels from the circulating libraries of a kind demanding less and less effort of attention and always her inability to concentrate appeared to her as a just demand for clarity the man has no business to write so that i can't understand him she laid in a weekly stock of opinions from the spectator and by this means contrived a semblance of intellectual life she was appeased more and more by the rhythm of the seasons of the weeks of day and night by the first coming up of the pink and wine-brown velvet primulas by the pungent burnt smell of her morning coffee the smell of a midday stew of hot cakes baking for tea-time by the lighting of the lamp the lighting of autumn fires the round of her visits she waited with a strained expectant desire for the moment when it would be time to see lizzie or sarah or connie pennefather again seeing them was a habit she couldn't get over but it no longer gave her keen pleasure she told herself that her three friends were deteriorating in their middle age lizzie's sharp face darted malice her tongue was whipcord 
she knew where to flick the small gleam of her eyes the snap of her nutcracker jaws irritated harriet sarah was slow slow she took no care of her face and figure as lizzie put it sarah's appearance was an outrage on her contemporaries she makes us feel so old and connie the very rucking of connie's coat about her broad hips irritated harriet she had a way of staring over her fat cheeks at harriet's old suits mistaking them for new ones and saying the same exasperating thing you're lucky to be able to afford it i can't harriet's irritation mounted up and up and one day she quarrelled with connie connie had been telling one of her stories leaning a little sideways her skirt stretched tight between her fat parted knees the broad roll of her smile sliding greasily she had grown out of it in her young womanhood and now in her middle age she had come back to it again she was just like her father connie how can you be so coarse i beg pardon i forgot you were always better than everybody else i'm not better than everybody else i've only been brought up better than some people my father would have died rather than have told a story like that i suppose that's a dig at my parents i never said anything about your parents i know the things you think about my father well i dare say he thinks things about me he thinks you were always an incurable old maid my dear did he think my father was an old maid i never heard him say one unkind word about your father i should hope not indeed unkind things were said not by him though he might have been forgiven i don't know what you mean but all my father's creditors were paid in full you know that i didn't know it you know it now was your father one of them no it was as bad for him as if he had been though how do you make that out well my dear if he hadn't taken your father's advice he might have been a rich man now instead of a poor one he invested all his money as he told him in my father's things in things he was interested in and he lost it it shows how he must have trusted him he wasn't the only one who was ruined by his trust harriet blinked her mind swerved from the blow i think you must be mistaken she said i'm less likely to be mistaken than you my dear though he was your father harriet sat up straight and stiff well your father's alive and he's dead i don't see what that has to do with it don't you if it had happened the other way about your father wouldn't have died connie stared stupidly at harriet not taking it in presently she got up and left her she moved clumsily her broad hips shaking harriet put on her hat and went round to lizzie and sarah in turn they would know whether it were true or not they would know whether mr hancock had been ruined by his own fault or papa's sarah was sorry she picked up a fold of her skirt and crumpled it in her fingers and said over and over again she oughtn't to have told you but she didn't say it wasn't true neither did lizzie though her tongue was a whip for connie because you can't stand her dirty stories she goes and tells you this it shows what connie is it showed her father as he was too not wise not wise all the time courageous always loving danger intolerant of security wild under all his quietness and gentleness taking madder and madder risks playing his game with an awful cool recklessness then letting other people in ruining mr hancock the little man he used to laugh at and it had killed him he hadn't been sorry for mamma because he knew she was glad the mad game was over but he had thought and thought about him the little dirty man until he had died of thinking end of chapter twelve recording by expatria in bangor maine chapter thirteen of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirteen new people had come to the house next door harriet saw a pretty girl going in and out she had not called she was not going to call their cat came over the garden wall and bit off the blades of the irises when he sat down on the mignonette harry sent a note round by maggie miss freen presents her compliments to the lady next door and would be glad if she would restrain her cat five minutes later the pretty girl appeared with the cat in her arms i brought mimi she said i want you to see what a darling he is 
mimi a persian all orange on the top and snow white underneath climbed her breast to hang flattened out against her shoulder long the great plume of his tail fanning her she swung round to show the innocence of his amber eyes and the pink arch of his mouth supporting his pink nose i want you to see my mignonette said harriet they stood together by the crushed ring where mimi had made his bed the pretty girl said she was sorry but you see we can't restrain him i don't know what's to be done unless you kept a cat yourself then you wouldn't mind but harriet said i don't like cats oh why not harriet knew why a cat was a compromise a substitute a subterfuge her pride couldn't stoop she was afraid of mimi of his enchanting play and the soft white fur of his stomach maggie's baby so she said because they destroy the beds and they kill birds the pretty girl's chin burrowed in mimi's neck you won't throw stones at him she said no i wouldn't hurt him what did you say his name was mimi harriet softened she remembered when i was a little girl i had a cat called mimi white angora very handsome and your name is brailsford i'm dorothy next time when mimi jumped on the lupins and broke them down dorothy came again and said she was sorry and she stayed to tea harriet revealed herself my father was hilton freen she had noticed for the last fifteen years that people showed no interest when she told them that they even stared as though she had said something that had no sense in it dorothy said how nice nice i mean it must have been nice to have him for your father you don't mind my coming into your garden last thing to catch mimi harriet felt a sudden yearning for dorothy she saw a pleasure a happiness in her coming she wasn't going to call but she sent little notes in to dorothy asking her to come to tea dorothy declined but every evening towards bedtime she came into the garden to catch mimi through the window harriet could hear her calling mimi mimi she could see her in her white frock moving about hovering ready to pounce as mimi dashed from the bushes she thought she walks into my garden as if it was her own but she won't make a friend of me she's young and i'm old she had a piece of wire netting put up along the wall to keep mimi out that's the end of it she said she could never think of the young girl without a pang of sadness and resentment fifty five sixty in her sixty-second year harriet had her first bad illness it was so like sarah barmby sarah got influenza and regarded it as a common cold and gave it to harriet who regarded it as a common cold and got pleurisy when the pain was over she enjoyed her illness the peace and rest of lying there supported by the bed holding out her lean arms to be washed by maggie closing her eyes in bliss while maggie combed and brushed and plaited her fine gray hair she liked having the same food at the same hours she would look up smiling weakly when maggie came at bedtime with the little tray what have you brought me now maggie benger's food ma'am she wanted to be always benger's food at bedtime she lived by habit by the punctual fulfilment of her expectation she loved the doctor's visits at twelve o'clock his air of brooding absorption in her case his consultations with maggie the seriousness and sanctity he attached to the humblest details of her existence above all she loved the comfort and protection of maggie the sight of maggie's broad tender face as it bent over her the feeling of maggie's strong arms as they supported her the hovering pressure of the firm broad body in the clean white apron and the cap her eyes rested on it with affection she found shelter in maggie as she had found it in her mother one day she said why did you come to me maggie couldn't you have found a better place well there was many wanted me but i came to you ma'am because you seemed to sort of need me most i dearly love looking after people old ladies and children and gentlemen if they're ill enough maggie said you're a good girl maggie she had forgotten the image of maggie's baby was dead hidden buried deep down in her mind she closed her eyes her head was thrown back motionless ecstatic under maggie's flickering fingers as they plaited her thin wisps of hair out of the peace of illness she entered on the misery and long labor of convalescence the first time maggie left her to dress herself she wept she didn't want to get well she could see nothing in recovery but the end of privilege and prestige the obligation to return to a task she was tired of a difficult and terrifying task 
by summer she was up and tremulously about again end of chapter thirteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fourteen of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fourteen she was aware of her drowsy supine dependence on maggie at first her perishing self asserted itself in an increased reserve and arrogance thus she protected herself from her own censure she had still a feeling of satisfaction in her exclusiveness her power not to call on new people i think lizzie pierce said you might have called on the brailsfords why should i i should have nothing in common with such people well considering that mr brailsford writes in the spectator harriet called she put on her grey silk and her soft white mohair shawl and her wide black hat tied under her chin and called it was on a saturday the Brailsford's room was full of visitors, men and women, talking excitedly. Dorothy was not there. Dorothy was married. Mimi was not there. Mimi was dead. Harriet made her way between the chairs, dim-eyed, upright, and stiff in her white shawl. She apologized for having waited seven years before calling. Never go anywhere. Quite a recluse since my father's death. He was Hilton Freen. Yes? Mrs. Brailsford's eyes were sweetly interrogative but as we are such near neighbours i felt that i must break my rule mrs brailsford smiled in vague benevolence yet as if she thought that miss freen's feeling and her action were unnecessary after seven years and presently harriet found herself alone in her corner she tried to talk to mr brailsford when he handed her the tea and bread and butter my father she said was connected with the spectator for many years he was hilton freen indeed i'm afraid i i don't remember she could get nothing out of him out of his lean ironical face his eyes screwed up behind his glasses benevolent amused at her she was nobody in that room full of keen intellectual people nobody nothing but an unnecessary little old lady who had come there uninvited her second call was not returned she heard that the brailsfords were exclusive they wouldn't know anybody out of their own set harriet explained her position thus no i didn't keep it up we have nothing in common she was old old she had nothing in common with youth nothing in common with middle age with intellectual exclusive people connected with the spectator she said the spectator is not what it used to be in my father's time harriet freen was not what she used to be she was aware of the creeping fret the poisons and obstructions of decay it was as if she had parted with her own light elastic body and succeeded to somebody else's that was all bone heavy stiff irresponsive to her will her brain felt swollen and brittle she had a feeling of tiredness in her face of infirmity about her mouth her looking-glass showed her the fallen yellow skin the furrowed lines of age her head dropped drowsy giddy over the week's accounts she gave up even the semblance of her housekeeping and became permanently dependent on maggie she was happy in the surrender of her responsibility of the grown-up self she had maintained with so much effort clinging to maggie submitting to maggie as she had clung and submitted to her mother her affection concentrated on two objects the house and maggie maggie and the house the house had become a part of herself an extension of her body a protective shell she was uneasy when away from it the thought of it drew her with passion the low brown wall with the railing the flagged path from the little green gate to the front door the square brown front the two oblong white-framed windows the dark green trellis porch between the three windows above and the clipped privet bush by the trellis and the may tree by the gate she no longer enjoyed visiting her friends she set out in peevish resignation leaving her house and when she had sat half an hour with lizzie or sarah or connie she would begin to fidget miserable till she got back to it again to the house and maggie she was glad enough when lizzie came to her she still liked lizzie best they would sit together one on each side of the fireplace talking harriet's voice came thinly through her thin lips precise yet plaintive 
lizzie's finished with a snap of the bent-in jaws do you remember those little round hats we used to wear you had one exactly like mine connie couldn't wear them we were wild young things said lizzie i was wilder than you a little audacious thing and look at us now we couldn't say boo to a goose well we may be thankful we haven't gone stout like connie pennefather or poor sarah that stoop they drew themselves up their straight slender shoulders rebuked connie's obesity and sarah's bent back her bodice stretched humpwise from the stuck-out ridges of her stays harriet was glad when lizzie went and left her to maggie in the house she always hoped she wouldn't stay for tea so that maggie might not have an extra cup and plate to wash the years passed the sixty-third sixty-fourth sixty-fifth their monotony mitigated by long spells of torpor and the sheer rapidity of time her mind was carried on empty in empty flying time she had a feeling of dryness and distension in all her being and a sort of crepitation in her brain irritating her to yawning fits after meals sitting in her armchair her book would drop from her hands and her mind would slip from drowsiness into stupor there was something voluptuous about the beginning of this state she would give herself up to it with an animal pleasure and content sometimes for long periods her mind would go backwards returning always returning to the house in black's lane she would see the row of elms and the white wall at the end with the green balcony hung out like a bird-cage above the green door she would see herself a girl wearing a big chignon and a little round hat or sitting in the curly chair with her feet on the white rug and her father slender and straight smiling half amused while her mother read aloud to them or she was a child in a black silk apron going up black's lane little audacious thing she had a fondness and admiration for this child and her audacity and always she saw her mother with her sweet face between the long hanging curls coming down the garden path in a wide silver-gray gown trimmed with narrow bands of black velvet and she would wake up surprised to find herself sitting in a strange room dressed in a gown with strange sleeves that ended in old wrinkled hands for the book that lay in her lap was longfellow open at evangeline one day she made maggie pull off the old washed-out cretonne covers exposing the faded blue rep she was back in the drawing-room of her youth only one thing was missing she went upstairs and took the blue egg out of the spare room and set it in its place on the marble top table she sat gazing at it a long time in happy childlike satisfaction the blue egg gave reality to her return when she saw maggie coming in with the tea and buttered scones she thought of her mother three more years harriet was sixty-eight she had a faint recollection of having given maggie notice long ago there in the dining-room maggie had stood on the hearth-rug in her large white apron crying she was crying now she said she must leave and go and take care of her mother mother's getting very feeble now i'm getting very feeble too maggie it's cruel and unkind of you to leave me i'm sorry ma'am i can't help it she moved about the room sniffing and sobbing as she dusted harriet couldn't bear it any more if you can't control yourself she said go into the kitchen maggie went harriet sat before the fire in her chair straight and stiff making no sound now and then her eyelids shook fluttered red rims slow scanty tears oozed and fell their trail glistening in the long furrows of her cheeks end of chapter fourteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen the door of the specialist's house had shut behind them with a soft respectful click lizzie pierce and harriet sat in the taxicab holding each other's hands harriet spoke he says i've got what mamma had lizzie blinked away her tears her hand loosened and tightened on harriet's with a nervous clutch harriet felt nothing but a strange solemn excitement and exultation she was raised to her mother's eminence in pain 
with every stab she would live again in her mother she had what her mother had only she would have an operation this different thing was what she dreaded the thing her mother hadn't had and the going away into the hospital to live exposed in the free ward among other people that was what she minded most that and leaving her house and maggie's leaving she cried when she saw maggie standing at the gate in her white apron as the taxicab took her away she thought when i come back again she won't be there yet somehow she felt that it wouldn't happen it was impossible that she should come back and not find maggie there she lay in her white bed in the white curtain cubicle lizzie was paying for the cubicle kind lizzie kind kind she wasn't afraid of the operation it would happen in the morning only one thing worried her something connie had told her under the anaesthetic you said things shocking indecent things but there wasn't anything she could say she didn't know anything yes she did there were connie's stories in black's lane behind the dirty blue palings in black's lane the nurses comforted her they said if you kept your mouth tight shut up to the last minute before the operation if you didn't say one word you were all right she thought about it after she woke in the morning for a whole hour before the operation she refused to speak nodding and shaking her head communicating by gestures she walked down the wide corridor of the ward on her way to the theatre very upright in her white flannel dressing-gown with her chin held high and a look of exaltation on her face there were convalescents in the corridor they saw her the curtains before some of the cubicles were parted the patients saw her they knew what she was going to her exaltation mounted she came into the theatre it was all white 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 tiles rows of little slender knives on a glass shelf under glass shining a white sink in the corner a mixed smell of iodine and ether the surgeon wore a white coat harriet made her tight lips tighter she climbed onto the white enamel table and lay down drawing her dressing-gown straight about her knees she had not said one word she had behaved beautifully the pain in her body came up wave after wave burning it swelled tightening stretching out her wounded flesh she knew that the little man they called the doctor was really mr hancock they oughtn't to have let him in she cried take him away don't let him touch me but nobody took any notice it isn't right she said he oughtn't to do it not to any woman if it was known he would be punished and there was maggie by the curtain crying that's maggie she's crying because she thinks i killed her baby the ice bag laid across her body stirred like a live thing as the ice melted then it settled and was still she put her hand down and felt the smooth cold oilskin distended with water there's a dead baby in the bed red hair they ought to have taken it away she said maggie had a baby once she took it up the lane to the place where the man is and they put it behind the palings dirty blue palings pussycat pussycat what did you there pussy prissy prissycat poor prissy she never goes to bed she can't get up out of the chair a figure in white with a stiff white cap stood by the bed she named it fixed it in her mind nurse nurse that was what it was she spoke to it it's sad sad to go through so much pain and then to have a dead baby the white curtain walls of the cubicle contracted closed in on her she was lying at the bottom of her white curtain nursery cot she felt weak and diminished small like a very little child the front curtains parted showing the blonde light of the corridor beyond she saw the nursery door open and the light from the candle moved across the ceiling the gap was filled by the heavy form the obscene yet sorrowful face of connie pennefather harriet looked at it she smiled with a sudden ecstatic wonder and recognition mamma end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of life and death of harriet freen by may sinclair